This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com slash Dominic Noble or follow the link in the video description to get 10% off your purchase using the code Dominic Noble. More on this later. Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the internet review show about comparing the plot and theme accuracy of film and TV adaptations of books to said books to see how true they stayed to the original plot and themes. Published in 1813, Pride and Prejudice is the second of six major novels by Jane Austen, a author well known for her stories about the romantic dramas of the British upper class that somehow combine exceptional politeness and good manners with incredible sass, wit and sarcasm. I honestly wish the latter was the first thing that people thought of in regards to her, but it does tend to be the former. Oh well. At this point in her career, she was publishing under the pseudonym A Lady. Despite the popularity of her work, she was encouraged to protect her identity so she didn't face the social stigma of being a woman who does things beyond being a wife and mother. Women were also not legally allowed to sign their own contracts back then, so most of her publishing was done through her brothers. A good professional partnership. She bought all the literary talent and they bought the acceptable genitalia. The novel's style of writing is assumed to have been formatted in a way that allowed for it to be easily read aloud amongst groups of friends or at small parties. Pretty successful in her time, Austin's work really hit its stride about 50 years after her death, when they were purchased and republished, gaining worldwide recognition. She still had her fair share of critics, of course. Charlotte Bronte, the author of Jane Eyre, famously disliked Pride and Prejudice, describing the portrait of life that Austen created as a carefully fenced, highly cultivated garden with neat borders and delicate flowers, but no open country, no fresh air, no blue hill, no bonny beck. Damn. Sick burn. The TV miniseries that premiered on the BBC in 1995 was not the first or last in a long line of adaptations of this book, but it was notable in how successful it was, receiving positive reception from audiences, critics, and award shows alike. Produced by Sue Birtwistle and directed by Simon Langton, the screenwriting was headed by Andrew Davies, who's something of an adaptation veteran, forming his entire career around them. It's also remembered for skyrocketing the career of Colin Firth, propelling him into stardom and a notable spot on the list of British sexual icons, and for having something of an earworm intro, which I can't play for you now due to copyright, but I imagine is already stuck in the head of fans. As usual, before we leap into the adaptation review, here are my thoughts on the book and the TV show as separate standalone entities. As I alluded to, I personally wish more people remembered the characters of Jane Austen for their cutting wit and sarcasm in equal measure to their uber politeness and eloquence, because the combination of the two is what really sold this book for me. I say, won't you join us in walking around the room for a bit? Absolutely not, that would entirely defeat the purpose of you getting up. Well, Mr. Darcy, whatever do you mean? Well, either you two intend to be gossipy bitches, or you wish me to admire your fine asses, and I can do that all the better from down here. Austin also seems determined to show through her writing that, while her gender was indeed consigned to a restrained, subservient role in her time period, that didn't mean that they were obliged to take people's bullshit. Good news, dearest cousin, I've decided to marry you. Nope. Uh, ah, ah, well, I know well the ways of women. You're clearly just playing hard to get to increase my interest. Did I fucking stutter, asshole? Just because of the current economic and political climate in the world in the year of our Lord 2020, I must confess to feeling a mild pang of rage that this book insists that the family with only a seven-bedroom house and but one servant are the poor people of the story. All in all, I guess I have to agree with the general positive opinion on this book. If you think you might want to try getting into period romance stories, Jane Austen is the best available style Pack. Overall, the series is really well put together, with compelling actors, good directing, and memorable scoring. The editing choices sometimes seem a little weird to me, causing accidental implications at times. For example, letters are usually read aloud via the writer's voiceover, and on multiple occasions characters have quite visceral, verbal reactions to what they're reading. This has the unfortunate side effect of making it look like they're talking to their letters. Another hilarious trend I noticed was their habit of framing Colin Firth in the background of shots in a way that makes him seem pretty malevolent. I mean, look at this, he looks like he's about to murder this guy! Okay, I make fun, but for real, this is a pretty solid show, no real complaints. Okay, let's talk adaptation. <laughs> 
the storyline remains almost unwaveringly intact throughout all six episodes. And going over every detail that was lifted right off the page would take a lifetime, but here's a summary of the plot beats that I was pleased were not neglected. News spreads around the town of Longbourn that a rich young gentleman by the name of Charles Bingley has rented the manor of Neverfield Park. Mrs. Bennet, a local mother of five daughters, is more than delighted to hear it, despite her husband's complete lack of interest, because she is firmly of the belief that it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife, and sees his arrival as a chance to secure a rich husband for one of her children. From oldest to youngest, said daughters being Jane, Elizabeth, Mary, Kitty, and Lydia. The Bennets attend a ball in the hopes of meeting Mr. Bingley, and much to Mrs. Bennet's delight, the gentleman is of exceptionally positive disposition and immediately taken with Jane, spending most of the evening dancing with her. His close friend, the outrageously wealthy Mr. Darcy, is less pleased with the evening and haughtily refuses to dance with Elizabeth, a frightfully rude thing to do in the time period, earning him an immediate and severe douchebag label in the eyes of the locals. Jane is highly encouraged by her mother to ride to Netherfield Park for a visit despite impending rain. She gets caught in the downpour and falls ill, forcing her to stay with the Bingleys for several days. Elizabeth, concerned for her sister and wishing to care for her, hikes through three miles of muddy fields and arrives at Netherfield in a dirty dress, much to the disdain of Bingley's entitled sister. Upon Elizabeth and Jane finally returning home, the Bennet household is visited by a Mr. Collins. Collins is a distant cousin of Mr. Bennet's whom he has never met in person. However, due to the Bennet property being entailed, a form of inheritance law that means it can only be passed down to the eldest male heir, he is going to inherit everything the family owns upon Mr. Bennet's death. Shortly after his arrival, he makes a proposal of marriage to his cousin Elizabeth, which she immediately refuses despite this offering her an opportunity to rescue her father's holdings for her and her sisters. Mrs. Bennet is most displeased with her and tries to viciously browbeat her into accepting, however her decision is backed up by her surprisingly cool father. Meanwhile, Lydia and Kitty have become acquainted with some militia officers stationed in a nearby town. Among them is George Wickham, a handsome young soldier who befriends Elizabeth and gossips to her about how Darcy cruelly cheated him out of an inheritance. Suddenly, without warning, the Bingleys and Darcy leave Netherfield and return to London, much to Jane's dismay, as she and Mr. B were getting on so well the entire town was convinced that they would be married very soon. The Bennets then receive news that Mr. Collins has gotten over Elizabeth's rejection remarkably fast and become engaged to her best friend, Charlotte Lucas, instead. Jane is encouraged to make a trip to London in the hopes of running into her lost love, however she only manages to encounter the uptight sister, Miss Bingley, who behaves very rudely towards her, and Mr. Bingley fails to see her at all. Elizabeth goes to visit Charlotte, who now lives near the home of Mr. Collins' patron, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, who also happens to be Mr. Darcy's aunt. One day, despite for all the world appearing to have had excessively cold feelings towards her until now, he suddenly and grudgingly professes that he has, despite his better judgement, fallen in love with her and proposes marriage. Mildly offended by this utterly shit proposal, and having figured out that Darcy had talked Bingley out of marrying Jane, she flatly rejects him, laying this charge at his feet along with his poor treatment of her new friend Wickham. Darcy doesn't deny the charges and leaves in a huff, however he later hand delivers a letter explaining himself. He then informs Elizabeth in no uncertain terms that Wickham is a dirty, filthy liar. He had willingly given up the inheritance that Darcy's father had intended for him in exchange for an immediate liquid cash payout, but had then turned around and unfairly demanded it again after squandering all the money. When Darcy had understandably refused, Wickham had attempted to get revenge and more cash out of him by eloping with his 15-year-old little sister, though Darcy had managed to save her. After re-evaluating her feelings about Darcy, Elizabeth returns home and acts understandably pretty coldly towards Wickham. Lydia is invited and a allowed to spend the summer with an old colonel and his wife in Brighton, where Wickham's regiment will be stationed. Meanwhile, Elizabeth, apparently quite the traveller, goes on yet another journey, this time to see the gardeners, relatives of the Bennets who live in Derbyshire, which, FYI, is where I went to university. Go Rams. They visit Pemberley, Darcy's offensively lavish estate, after Elizabeth triple checks that Darcy is not going to be there. Alas, he actually is, but is super nice to her, willingly entertaining her and the gardeners. Shortly after, however, a letter arrives telling Elizabeth that Lydia has done a runner and eloped with the nefarious Wickham. Elizabeth confines in Darcy that she is fearful that such a scandal will bring ruin to the entire Bennet family. 
Uh, just go with it. It's tied into uptight British upper-class culture. Elizabeth hurries home while Mr. Gardner and Mr. Bennett go off to search for Lydia. Things keep looking worse and worse when it's discovered that Wickham has massive gambling debts that he's probably fleeing, and he might not be planning to marry Lydia after all, just bang her and abandon her. Mr. Bennett eventually returns home empty-handed, but just as all appears hopeless, a letter comes from Mr. Gardner with the good news that Wickham has been found and agreed to marry Lydia in exchange for a meagre annual income, thus saving the girl's honour and the family's reputation. The Bennets assume that Mr. Gardner paid off Wickham's debts in exchange for this, but Elizabeth later learns through her now married but loose-lipped little sister that the source of the money was in fact Mr. Darcy. Bingley returns with Darcy to Netherfield and resumes his courtship of Jane, offering his hand in marriage pretty soon after, to much rejoicing all round. However, Darcy's aunt and resident party pooper Lady Catherine de Bourgh pays a visit to Elizabeth and confronts her with the rumour that she's heard that Darcy is going to marry the much less wealthy and connected girl. She has come to put a stop to it, partly because she considers her far too below her nephew's station, and partly because she and Darcy's mother had long ago decided that Darcy will marry her daughter, his cousin. She demands a promise from Elizabeth that she will not accept a proposal from Darcy if he makes it. To her rage, Elizabeth spiritedly refuses. A little later, the rumours are proved true. Elizabeth and Darcy go out walking together, and he tells her that his feelings have not changed. This time around, she gladly accepts his offer of marriage. She delightfully tells her family. Her father is concerned that she might be marrying out of a sense of duty and won't be happy, but she manages to convince him that, despite how badly they used to publicly dislike each other, they are now very much in love. Bingley marries Jane, and Darcy marries Elizabeth. The end. I will say, not all of this stuff is revealed in the same order in the book, as a lot happens off-page and is described after the fact, but acting it out sequentially is one of those adaptation necessities that makes perfect sense. In fact, I might go as far as to say that everything that could possibly have been brought to screen, every event described in a letter, and every recollection mentioned offhand is done so. The showrunners clearly couldn't quite bring themselves to neglect anything from the novel, even converting some of Austin's mood or scene-setting writing into dialogue. For example, the famous opening line about a rich man wanting a missus is now said out loud by Elizabeth in a sarcastic response to her mother's excitement over Bingley's arrival. I would say they successfully captured the essence of almost every major character. Darcy, the guy who acts like a complete asshole but is actually quite nice. Wickham, the guy who acts really nice but is actually a complete asshole. And Bingley, the sweet, sweet cinnamon roll who acts really nice and is really nice. Jane's hopeless romantic nature, Elizabeth's cool wit, Mr. Bennick being a low-key sass queen, it's all lifted right out of the book, and I have to say I'm impressed. I should go and talk to Mr. Darcy. Oh, I wouldn't. He doesn't like being approached by randos without an official introduction. Oh, pish posh, what do you know? You're just a woman. You don't understand these things. Hello there, my good man. How dare you speak to me? Um, I think that went rather well. <laughs> There's what I would consider quite minor changes throughout regarding locations that certain conversations took place in, or the exact timing of certain events. They toned down how well some of the characters hid their thoughts, vocalising things, and enhancing how they reacted to events to make it more clear how they felt about them. Again, this is pretty standard for any adaptation that can no longer rely on a narration to tell us what they're thinking like the book could. Casting-wise, the only minor issue is Jennifer Ely being a somewhat mature-looking 25-year-old trying to pass off for 19, and not really doing so? The miniseries is perhaps a tad unkind to Mary Bennett. She was awkward and a somewhat poor singer in the book, but the miniseries really ramped up how often she was teased by her sisters and goes out of its way to mock her lack of musical talent. In relation to this, Lydia's mean streak is also amped up. She was always a bit selfish and precocious, but I wouldn't say she was ever actively cruel to her sisters like she sometimes was in the show. I would theorise that this might have been to reduce audience sympathy for her as Wickham's victim. I must confess I was slightly appalled that the happy ending of her story was a 16 year old girl marrying a significantly older creep who doesn't give a damn about her. The epilogue of the book mentions that they didn't have a completely terrible marriage but they did lose affection for each other eventually and spent their whole lives moving around without much money, often dependent on a 
Elizabeth's charity to survive. It was generally accepted by those who knew her and her husband that she would never be truly happy. Her mother, Mrs. Bennet, is even more villainized by the series, though it is more subtle in doing so. She was indeed intent on marrying off her daughters to men of means to the point where their enthusiasm for the marriage or the fact that they were in love with a creep or a child molester meant little to nothing to her. However, the key difference is in the book it's made much more clear that her primary motivation was the fact that Mr. Bennet's will was utter shite and would have left his wife and daughters absolutely penniless upon his death, so without affluent husbands her beloved children were basically doomed to destitution and homelessness. The absence of this makes her look like a marriage-obsessed social climber with no regard for her children's happiness and the butt of several jokes at her expense. Mr. Bennet, who is generally regarded as the better parent for being so chill with his daughters and respectful of their wishes, is in fact being somewhat irresponsible and short-sighted compared to his wife. In the book, Mr. Bennet's flat-out refusal to allow Wickham and Lydia to his estate after the way they had behaved was entirely serious, and it took some convincing before he relented. In the miniseries, his refusal is played off as a sight gag by immediately cutting to Lydia and Wickham arriving. Colin's sycophantic nature towards Lady Catherine was already pretty extreme in the book, but they still managed to flanderise the heck out of him in the show. I wouldn't say this is a true change, but the editing sometimes implies without directly confirming that certain things are happening sequentially that were days or even weeks apart in the book. This successfully ramps up the pace of the story slightly without really deviating from the source material. Well played. The show, just for a few seconds, does something that the book certainly did not, i.e. acknowledge that poor people exist. Darcy is given a few extra scenes to flesh out his character. There's some romantic moments between him and Bingley, including him giving him his unnecessary but still appreciated blessing to marry Jane. It gives these two a noticeable sense of friendship instead of just telling us that they're friends like the book did. You also get some hints of his admiration for Lizzie, so his side of the growth from dislike to affection has an easier transition. My favourite additional scene of his involves him channeling some of his frustrations into some manly swordplay and muttering an off-book but still pretty boss line. I shall conquer this. I shall. The TV series also sexualized Darcy in a way that would definitely have caused Jane Austen a terrible case of the vapors despite how ahead of her time she was. Oh my, would you look at that. Uh, yeah, it, it makes sense that he's in the bath. He's a dirty, dirty boy. Goodness, Mr. Darcy, the summer heat has gotten you terribly sweaty. I, I, I agree. You should indeed strip down and take a swim in the lake and walk back in a wet seafood shirt. Oh no, Mrs. Bennet, where? Ever will she look? That being said, this scene does actually serve at least some purpose besides thirst, showing his sweeter side as he cheeses it into the house to make himself presentable before she can leave in awkwardness. And despite the entire plot revolving around who's going to marry whom, there is not one single wedding actually described in the book. Each and every one is skipped over. The show not only covers the double wedding between the two main couples, but also the rather unfortunate one between Wickham and Lydia. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just the way he jumps up like that. It gets me every time. Once and for all, girl, are you currently engaged to my nephew, Mr. Darcy? No. Good, and I want your solemn promise that you will say no if he asks you to marry him. Oh, yes, of course I have your promise right here in my pocket as it happens. <gasps> Goodness, that's not a promise at all. I'm so embarrassed. Well, perhaps this crank can summon it. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> The only halfway significant omission is the epilogue of the story. The book skips forward a few years and confirms that the Bingleys and the Darcys were all very happy in their marriages, and amusingly, Jane and her husband both quickly agreed that Three Miles was just not quite far enough away from her mother and moved. Minor omissions that I might not have even mentioned if this section was more bountiful include Elizabeth has a fleeting crush on Darcy's cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, in the book. Everyone likes a guy in uniform. A lot of instances of Bingley hanging out with the Bennets to be close to Jane has been taken out, I guess to avoid repetition. And that's about it. It's a pretty thorough miniseries. Final thoughts. It's safe to say this scored high marks with me across the board. Plot accuracy, theme accuracy, and successful conversion into a visual medium. This might be because this series has a lot of advantages that other adaptations don't enjoy. It of course had a lot more runtime at its disposal compared to movies, and as I mentioned right at the start, a certain element of performance may always have been intended in the way it was written, predisposing it to a smooth transition into a screenplay. And it certainly didn't hurt that it had a writer with a ton of adaptations under his belt already. 
So all in all, I think it would be really hard to top this adaptation. That said, I know a lot of attempts have been made. It's not out of the question for me to do another episode sometime discussing and comparing all the different adaptations if there is some interest in that. I'll tell you what, we'll set it as a milestone. This episode was co-written and edited by my new assistant Kate, aka That Movie Chick. When her channel hits 20,000 subscribers, we'll come back to Pride and Prejudice to celebrate. And now, a word from Mr. Darcy about today's sponsor. I, uh, I know everyone's well aware that the internet didn't exist in his time, so this joke doesn't make any sense, but hello my beautiful watchers. I'm just here to give you a quick update on the website that I'm building using today's sponsor, Squarespace. Using Squarespace's massive range of custom templates, I, a simple book lover with no programming skills, have been able to start putting together a unique and professional looking website completely unaided. Though, if aid ever was required due to, say, technical difficulties down the line, they offer 24 hour support to resolve issues, so I've never felt alone in the endeavor. So far, I have an about page, a blog about what I'm working on right now, a contact page, and thanks to the suggestions put forward by people last time, I'm working on adding a page for the official Patreon to-do list. Do keep the suggestions coming if there's anything else you'd like to see. And of course, if you happen to find yourself in need of a website and would like to enjoy all the stress-reducing advantages of Squarespace, there's a commitment-free two-week trial, and my viewers get 10% off their first purchase with them. Just go to squarespace.com slash Dominic Noble or click the link in the description. That's squarespace.com slash Dominic Noble and use the code Dominic Noble. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Don't forget to leave a like and comment if you enjoyed the video so the channel doesn't get forsaken by the merciless, unfeeling horror that is the YouTube algorithm. Please take care of yourselves out there and I will see you soon. Men of greatest fortune and with sass beyond compare He can see your ass just fine, no need to leave his chair Mr. Darcy, you will much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz and Sam Cucinotta. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That that's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dome, I can't do that, according to the rather unusual laws of my country, I must defeat several alligators in Mortal Kombat before I'm legally allowed to support online content, and I'm afraid my reptilian martial arts are just not what they used to be. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickaroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. Old lady voice. Hmm. I'm Lady Catherine, and I'm not very nice. No, 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 uh, what's it for? No, to, to Monty Python. I like the way it hugs in at the, uh, the sides like this. It gives the impression of slenderness. Wish, uh, wish dude's clothing did that. Once and for all, girl, are you engaged to my nephew, Mr. Darcy? Okay, that'll do. That's propelling him into stardom and a notable spot on the list of sexual British, sexual, sexual British, sexual. Sound check, sound check. Hey, Mr. Darcy, whatever do you mean? Mm. Good, and I want your. Sp I'm, I'm attached to my dress. Ugh. Is the second of six major novels by novels. It's disturbing how well this dress actually fits my manly, manly chest. This episode was co-written and edited by my new assistant, Kate. Kate? Stumbling over the word Kate, that's impressive. Good! And I want your... Again! Does this keep happening?